Welcome to Conversations with the Authors. Welcome back to Conversations with the Author. I'm your host, Daniel Troop, and today we're diving into the world of fantasy and exploring the magic behind the creation of a captivating tale. For those of you who are fans of Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, and Lord of the Rings, you're in for a treat. My fellow co-hosts, Sandra Joe and Daryl Troop, the talented authors of How Nicholas Became Santa Claus, a novel that captured the hearts of many readers, is now in its third printing. In this episode, we'll discuss the process behind a fantasy story brought to life. From the initial spark of the idea to the final draft, we'll explore the ups and downs, the hard work, and the moments of pure joy that go into creating a story filled with allegory, emotion, and lore. We'll be sharing some of the exclusive insights into the making of how Nicholas became Santa Claus, from the themes they wanted to explore to the challenges they faced along the way. My parents will be revealing the nuts and bolts of what it takes to create a fully fleshed-out dramatic fantasy. So sit back, relax, and join us as we take you on a journey into a world of fantasy and the power of belief. Thank you for tuning in, pressing the play button, and enjoy this episode of Conversations with the Authors. I'd like to thank Alex Nakarada for composing our intro. I'm Daniel Troop. I'm Daryl. I'm Sandra Jo. I want to talk a little bit about the journey, your journey, as writers, which we touched on a bit in our previous episode. And so I want to begin by asking an arguably simple question, but a question I think our listeners and readers are probably struggling with, and that is, why do you write stories? And more importantly, where do you start? You know, story writing is something that uh, has a long tradition, going back as far as the caveman, probably, when they sat around the fire and told stories. Mm -hmm. Stories convey meaning, they convey morals, they convey a history of, uh, of uh, challenge and defeat. And, and they're, they're something that teach people things. So... I think we're in that tradition. We, we just, you have a story in you and it's kind of like the music is in you, you and you got to get it out. Yeah. So that's, that's what that is. We, you get a story in you and you just have to get it out. <laughs> sort of a, sort of a, you know, Pandora's box of creativity, you know, well, sometimes it can be. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and, and uh -huh. Sandra, uh, what about you? Well, why do you write stories and how do you start? Stories. Sometimes I write for escape. Sometimes I write to center myself. Other times I write to entertain little kids that are running around the house driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. And other times I write because I dreamt about something and it's like, I got to get it out because it sounds so damn good. So it's really, it's really this... Uh, almost primordial drive to tell stories. I, I think that's something very human. I, I think people people love stories. Right, right. They want to inhabit somebody's uh, life. They want to see what it's like to be someone different. You, because when you watch a story or when you hear a story, you identify with it. That's right, that identification. Right. And so you can live through somebody else's adventure or, or turmoil and not be hurt by it, but learn from it. That's why we like movies and we like television and we listen to radio plays and we go to plays. But, you know, telling stories is like having a conversation, I think. It's, it's somehow, sometimes when you talk, you may be saying something, but there might not be meaning behind it. And when you're telling a story, there's, there has to be some sort of motivation. There has to be some sort of um, purpose behind it. Well, there's there's a drive, right? You have a drive. Mm -hmm. There's a drive to tell a story. And with, with me, a lot of times it was to distract you guys while I was 
doing something you disliked or didn't want to do or something I disliked and didn't want to do. And we did, we discussed, again, in our first episode, we discussed... Um, we discussed Nicholas as a, this fantasy adventure, mm-hmm. but he didn't choose to go on this journey. He was sort of thrust into it um, because uh, there, there's this king and his three sons, and they, they have this right to, you know, the right to the throne. You want to be the one in charge. You want to be the one up next. And sort of this prophecy came about um, that sort of pushed the story forward. Um, well, we, we put Nicholas in that position because uh, we imagined it. Mm-hmm. And so, but any story has to have conflict. Mm-hmm. And so we had a conflict and we pursued that. The uh, protagonist in the, in the story, uh, Nicholas, uh, is, a very, is a strong driving force in the story. You know, his, 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 his job is to resolve the issue. And so, but there's always somebody else in the story whose job it is to stop it from doing that. That's the antagonist. Yeah. So, <clears throat> if if you don't have conflict, you don't have a story. Any story you can think of, you've got to have a conflict. There's a problem that needs resolution. And so, um, he's just another example of a character that we made, we came up with, that has to resolve an issue. We well, also said that mom's story had a few pages, it was really, I don't know, 10 or so pages or what have you, and you stopped everything uh, to work together as a couple to write How Nicholas Became Santa Claus. So what, what's your writing process as a couple? How did you flush out the story and the characters together? I can understand how you could do it as, a, as an individual. It's like, oh, I've got this character. Mm-hmm. I want to make him strong. I want to make him, you know... Uh, deal with you know, such and such and such, but as a as a couple, you now have two minds working at the story that argue that will inevitably conflict. So how did you how did you work through that? The first step was for me to read what I had written to your father, mm-hmm. and then I asked him his opinion, and he would give me his opinion, and I either liked it or I didn't like it or we bantered it about because neither one of us liked it. Or there were things that we did like, so we had to have a common agreement on things. And uh, I, I said some things, she said some mm-hmm. things. We both, it was almost like uh, a vote, and we kind of decided what we were going to put in there. And if it worked for the story, it always had to serve the story. So okay. you wrote it out. Yeah, we did write you, it. You have to write it out. If you right. don't write it out, you're going to have the never-ending story. Right. So you, you, know, a, you, have, you have to a, know the ever-changing you, story. An ever-changing story, right? An outline is important. An outline is very. Not important. only do you know where you, where you are and where you're going, mm-hmm. but you know what's happened along the way, so you don't sort of double when, back. When you when you outline right. a story, you know all of the characters that are going to be in the story. You know where the story's going to go. You know the, 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 the story that's beneath that. Sometimes there are uh, some sub-stories mm-hmm. that are going on. You know where it's going to end up. Mm-hmm. If you don't outline it, you're going to write forever, or you're not going to write enough. It won't make sense. So at least with an outline, you can, you can skip around in your outline and make sure that things are consistent. Right. And this, this story is, is truly, this story is a fleshed out story. So how did you go from 10 pages? Did you, did you write the ending first? Did you write the conflict? Did you, you know, s- did, t- 10 pages is kind of like when you see a preview mm-hmm. of a movie. Uh-huh. You know, and they, ju- they show you a little part of it mm-hmm. so you can get the gist of what it's going to be. It's like the back page of a book, mm-hmm. like the back page of our book will give you a, a really good description of the story. And you know what the story is going to be uh, uh, like, but only until you read it will you know what it's going to be about. Right? Right. Mm-hmm. And um, how did you deal with conflicting ideas? With a lot of colored pencils. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, how, and how does that work? Striking this out, striking that out, putting this in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you, when you take a lot of time uh, to write a story... You know, you're you're going to 
have some conflict with the other writer. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can fall in love with the things you write. Uh huh. You know, but you can't be in love with it so much that you can't cut it. So, I, wait. <laughs> I got to ask then. Falling in love. You've put pen to paper. You've spent hours, days, months, years writing this story. You developed a character, a world even that you love. Mm-hmm. And now someone has to die or something has to happen. How do you come to terms with killing off a beloved character, a character well, you, you love? You don't want with you, one sentence. And that is. Is it going to make the story go forward? Yes. But that, I, I was going to say but that, I right? I love this character. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good. You're supposed to love the character. If you don't care about the character, then it doesn't matter if the character dies or not. If you care about the character, it's going to bring up some kind of emotion when you read it. When you see that character go, you're going to cry. We want you to cry. We want you to laugh, too. But we want you to, if somebody dies, you got to feel it. You've worked in the field of the mind, psychiatry, for 30 or so, maybe more years. More. How does that play into creating these characters? Does that help you? Does it hurt you? Does it... How do you... Um, well, I, 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 I think it helps me because I learn about the human condition. Mm-hmm. And the story is human. And it has to relate to humans. Right. Uh, so I've, I've seen tragic things. I've seen wonderful things mm-hmm. you know, in the field that I work in. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's something that's going to show up in your writing, too. It has to. Right. So uh, you, you can't feel like you can't kill somebody in your story right. because if you, if you don't do it and it, and it doesn't move the, the story forward, then you've made an error. You know, if it moves the story forward, great. Right. If it doesn't, then he can't die. But if it does move the for his, uh, story forward and your reader feels it, right. that's good. Well, some of our readers are also writers, but not all of our writers are psychiatrists who've been dealing with the human condition. So how do you convey to them how to develop a character uh, worthy of living and or, I guess in this case, worthy of dying? You have to imbue your characters with human qualities. You have to do that. You have to make them very human. And so... Uh, that their life has meaning, not only to the other characters involved in the story, but they have to have meaning to you as the reader. Remember what I said earlier, you have to care about your character. So we have to make them human. How how do we do that for our animals? How do we anthropomorphize them? They have to be your pet. In such a way... Okay. You have to feel at them as if they were your pet. Well, okay. you, you, we anthropomorphize all the time. We do that with our pets. You know, we look at our, our, our pet does something wrong, and he shows you the big eyes, and you said, "You know, you did that. Why did you do that?" Mm-hmm. Well, he doesn't know why he did it, perhaps, but we sure think he does, and and we put that on him and in him. Mm-hmm. You know, so and well, we do it with our insects too. Right, I right. mean, we go to. A, a, a picnic and it's, well, why, why, why did you land on that? Or we go mm-hmm. to a, a, a beach and, and something bites you. It's almost, it remi- you know what, you what it reminds me? It reminds me of an old song that I, I heard when I was a kid. It was called the Bull Weevil Song. And a farmer was getting attacked by the Bull Weevils. And he said, well, why did you choose my farm? <laughs> we covered creating a character. We covered creating, we covered creating a story. Where to start? How to start? How do you start a character? How do you begin a character? You you start a character when you start the story. And when you start the story, you just start it. I had a lot of people ask me. So well, just I, go. I, they said, the I, I always wanted to write a book, but I didn't know where to start. Well, you start as if you just opened the door and you peeked in and things were happening. So there's a, there's a thing in poetry called free versing. Where you pretty much, there's no rhyme, there's no reason, you just write. So you're saying, just write. You know, I could start a story, and in the very first paragraph, 
somebody's falling out of a window. Right, right. So how did he get there? We don't know yet, but we know this is happening. Okay, so you you start the story where it's with exciting a, with a bang. You started with crescendo. You, okay, so you say start with a start start with so a bang. I want to start start with two symbols that I gotta knock the sound out of my head and then I'll quiet it down from there. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it used to be that uh, in the past, centuries ago, hundred years ago, even stories were. Uh, they had long starts, you know, and it took a long time before you got to something exciting. We don't do that so much anymore. We, we, a lot of authors will say, and as I said before, you start with a bang. You just start the story. All right. So you started with a bang. You've got great characters. You've got a great world. You've got characters you love, characters who are inevitably going to die. What do you do to keep your momentum how do you stay motivated what do you what do you do to battle the mundane and the monotonous well when it gets monotonous you got to stop you got to stop and take a break you got to think and always remember when you write a story you want you're entertaining Mm -hmm. you want to have something happen on every page you've heard the term page turner that's what we kind of did here, because it's not going to get boring on you as soon as you turn the page of something else happening. When I introduce a character in the story for the first time, I just I just don't say, here's John Jones. And there he is. I show John Jones getting shot, you know, or or maybe uh, he's on a runaway wagon or, or maybe he's in a, in a fist fight in a bar. This is what's got to happen. you got to start it again. We get back to starting with a bang. But uh um, you don't do the mundane. Mm-hmm. You do the exciting. Keep that's, it exciting. That's, that's what it's about. Like and every good relationship, keep it exciting. Right. Keep it exciting. Right. Yeah, at exciting. one point, we were writing, and we were upstairs with your grandpa, and, and he was listening to us have a conversation about the writing. <clears throat> and I asked your father, I said, is this getting too long? And your grandpa entered the conversation and said if you got to ask the question the answer is it's it was too long an hour ago right 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 <laughs> so that i guess that goes to the heart of cutting mm-hmm. so you have to know when to cut you know just like the director says cut you know when a movie is made for instance that's not the way it, on screen the way it looked in the in the editing room I'll tell you how it looked. Look at the editing room floor and see the film right, pieces right. that have been cut right. out. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I know a lot about that. There's a lot of editing. Uh, when I was doing cinematography, uh, there was a lot of times we were in the cutting room and we're really, truly fine picking a film. Yeah, it looks like a chicken shaped brain. Out, and you've got this, this pile on the floor. Um, so I, I want to ask you. When it comes to creating the good guys and the bad guys, how how do you pick and choose? How do you do that? How do you decide what makes the villain? What's your approach to creating the villains in the books? Well, I, I think simply put, the antagonist, who's usually your villain, opposes the protagonist. The protagonist is pushing for a story forward. He's got a goal, and you've got an antagonist that wants to stop him from that goal. And so you might you have to come up with a really, really compelling character, someone that people, if not identify with, they can love to hate. Is what you know? job does he have to do? Mm-hmm. How vicious does he have to be mm-hmm. to do the job? How steadfast and hard-headed does your person who's going to stop them mm-hmm. have to be and what do they have to do when when, <clears throat> when i'm writing i remember what a lot of uh, actors say that it's fun to play the villain the villain doesn't have many bounds you know right, right. so it's hard it's hard to be moral it's hard to have bounds if you're the protagonist because you have to stay within a moral line but if you're the villain you can you can step all outside that line and actually 
it's kind of fun because you get a. It's almost like a. So release there's really, to you. there's there really is an art to it. Yeah. yeah. And as this episode is called "The Art of the Idea," um, it uh, truly shows how much creativity goes into writing a story. As readers and listeners, if you're interested in picking up a copy of How Nicholas Became Santa Claus, you can find it at troopbooks.com, T-R-O-U-P-E.com, where you can find the author page, Ewing's Publishing House. Uh, you can The books are available there. You can also visit their Facebook page at Troop Books on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, all the same name, Troop Books, T-R-O-U-P-E. And we will talk with you and hopefully you and you, Mom, Dad, thank you so much. Thank you. Next You're time welcome. on Conversations with the Authors. Thank you.